Life without DNA and a bunch of corrections and emails and a very large mailbag. This is Genesis Week. Welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the origins controversy made possible by you, the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education. Coming to you live from my brother's spare bedroom and airing right across the Canada on the Miracle Channel, all over the US on the WAC television, satellites all around the globe, and of course, the Chris Genema Network on YouTube. ChrisGenema.com, Christian Cinema at its finest. We believe God gave you an intelligently designed brain and he expects you to use it. Now remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in wazulu.com, that's me, or genesisweek.com, that's the show. And you can find us and also subscribe to my YouTube channel to get extras like Crevo Rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. Once again, an intrepid reporter called my attention to a fascinating article regarding artificial enzymes being produced in the lab without DNA or RNA. Now let me explain the technical lingo first so you can truly understand the humor of the situation. The evolutionary paradigm seeks to explain life and diversity of species without intelligent design, without a creator. A huge factor in all of this, of course, is the rise of that first life. Now, as I've mentioned in multiple Crevo rants and on this show, life arising from non-life is in direct violation of well-established scientific and natural laws, such as the law of biogenesis. Now, the law of biogenesis is quite simple. Life only comes from life. You do not see life arising from a rock. Yet this is precisely what evolution propones. That life arose from minerals and chemicals in the pre oceans. Minerals and chemicals that came from the erosion of rocks. Now, you are certainly welcome to believe this, but let's call it what it is. If it violates scientific and natural law, then what you are proposing is neither scientific nor natural. It is, by definition, supernatural. A miracle. Check out Frogs Are Useful, Crevo Rants number 93 and 94, where I apply the well-established natural laws of biogenesis and thermodynamics to the origins debate. Now, some anti-creationists attempt to dance around the issue, claiming that evolution does not attempt to explain the origin of life. Hogwash! That is dishonesty in its highest form. And I demonstrated Crevo rant number 63 that evolution and the origin of life are married to each other. If you have no life, evolution is dead at the starting line. So evolutionary theory must come up with a way in which life can arise without any pre-existing life. The irony here being that researchers are literally trying to find out how a miracle happened trying to deduce something that, by definition, is outside of the scientific and natural realm, and thus cannot be studied. Even attempting to build the very basic building blocks of life, amino acids, has insurmountable problems, as was demonstrated in Miller's famous experiment, and examination of amino acids found in meteorites, amino acids forming by natural processes form both left-handed and right-handed amino acids, mirror images of each other. Now, life only uses right-handed amino acids, as left-handed amino acids are toxic to life. Amino acids join together to form proteins, which is like putting nuts, bolts, and raw construction material together into small machines, the proteins. Throwing in a bolt with left-handed threads will completely mess up the machine. Well, it's no different with life. The left-handed amino acids will join with the rest of the protein, thus destroying the protein. Now, completely ignoring the left-hand-right-hand problem, 
nature still cannot form even one protein. I show this mathematically in Crevo Rant number 107. Now, our bodies make proteins using DNA, RNA, and an extremely complicated transcription system made of biological machines, which are made out of proteins, which were assembled using instructions contained within the DNA. So this is more like the extreme version of the chicken and the egg quandary. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, this is actually a nonsensical question, because it was neither. It was the chicken and the rooster that came about at the same time. In like fashion, asking which came first, the DNA or the transcription system, is a nonsensical question, because both the DNA and the transcription system came about at the same time. One cannot exist without the other. And just like any other machine, all the parts had to be designed and constructed at the same time by an outside intelligence. Now in chemistry, a catalyst is a compound or element which triggers or accelerates a chemical reaction without being consumed in the process. In biology, we have what are called enzymes. Enzymes are like a biological catalyst. They trigger or accelerate biological processes. So in this most recent paper that just came out in Nature, the researchers made DNA in the lab, what they called XNA. The DNA is constructed of bases and a backbone, each made of certain chemical compounds. In the case of this synthetic DNA, they replaced the chemicals in the backbone with other chemicals. The XNA was able to fold in such a three-dimensional way that it was able to do some biological jobs. It was, in effect, an enzyme. Now, the researchers have high hopes to be able to make enzymes not found in nature to do specific work within the body, for example. Now, this is fascinating and exciting research, but the twist to make all of this fit somehow, some way, into evolution and the origin of life from non-life is where it becomes downright funny. For instance, the headliner on the Science Alert article reads, World first, artificial enzymes suggest life doesn't need DNA or RNA. New scientists titled their article more boldly and blatantly. Synthetic enzymes hint at life without DNA or RNA. Now remember, we here at Genesis Week believe God gave you a brain to use it and we hope that you did bring it with you today. If you did, you may have spotted the non-sequitors already. The headlines and the article are trying to imply that this artificial DNA can enlighten us on the alleged time before there was life, and how life may have evolved from non-life. Well, let's break it down. First of all, was any DNA involved in the process of making this artificial DNA? Was there any life in the mix before the XNA was produced? Now, if you read the paper, you might conclude, no. After all, they are competent researchers. Presumably, they were careful about keeping everything sterile and keeping watch for contamination. However, there was an obvious and huge contamination of both the DNA and pre-existing life inadvertently introduced into the experiment. Right off the hop, the DNA from Taylor, Pinheiro, Smola, Morganov, Pikachu, Cousins, Weeks, Herduin, and Holliger was involved. After all, they were the ones who made this artificial DNA, and they exist only because of their DNA. They are also very much alive. So we also have pre-existing life and intelligent design involved in the experiment. Then you have the DNA, pre-existing life, and intelligent design of the engineers who made the intelligently designed equipment that these guys used to make their artificial DNA. There's a whole lot of DNA involved here, and a whole lot of pre-existing life, and a whole lot of intelligent design. Thus, these researchers, while contributing fascinating insight into the medical fields, have only contributed one thing to the discussion of the origin of life. 
they have further proved the law of biogenesis, that life only comes from life and pre-existing intelligence. They have only further proven the need for a creator, a supreme intelligence outside of nature, pre-existing before the natural. Now, raising the dead is just as difficult as producing life from dead matter. Our best minds on planet Earth cannot do this. If someone were to do this, we would call it a miracle. This is precisely what Jesus Christ did multiple times. Only the Creator could do this. And He did it with the spoken word. Precisely what the scriptures tell us the Creator did in the beginning. God spoke and life arose. Jesus spoke, and the dead rose to life. Jesus also spoke of a judgment to come, a great white throne judgment where all who have lived and died will give an account of their life. He said the only way to obtain eternal life was to be born again. Well, what does that mean? It means to turn from your sinful ways or rebellion against God. Ask for forgiveness. Believe that Jesus was the Son of God and that he died for you. And he promises to give you the gift of the Holy Ghost and eternal life. He even demonstrated this by rising from the dead to show you he is the way, the truth, and the life. What's stopping you from being born again today? What's stopping you from embracing eternal life? Hmm? Thank you to all of you who supported the show, both in morale and finances. It's been a rough year so far. Hopefully we're back on track. This show continues on because of your financial support, and as we reach the year's end, please consider donating to the production costs of Genesis Week. Canadians can get a tax-deductible receipt for donations written out to CORE Ottawa. Just remember to include your mailing address. You can donate either online at ianjuby.org. No PayPal account is required. Just click on the continue and you can make a donation by credit card. Or you can mail a check to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box, 72075 Ottawa, Ontario. K2K2P4. Now please note we can only offer a tax deductible receipt to Canadian donors. Thank you for your support. The addresses will be repeated at the end of the show. Stick around, we'll be back in one minute. Oh, not again. To the horror of both fans and enemies, Ian Juby is back with more ranting goodness. Okay, Jacques, you first. Just when you thought his meds had kicked in, Ian goes off on a tangent about what killed the dinosaurs. The origin of life defining evolution, and yes, even sex. It wasn't enough for an R rating, but nowadays, what is? Volume 4 of his ever-popular and ever-hated Karevo rants has eight new short, fast, funny, and hard-hitting episodes. You can get your copy on the soon-to-be-extinct DVD for 15 bucks plus shipping and handling, or purchase the instant digital download of all eight tracks for just eight bucks. Or you can buy all four volumes of his world-infamous rants for the price of three. Order your copies today and have a party with, like, popcorn and stuff. Visit Ian's bookstore today. Woohoo! Mail for me! Several people pointed out some confusion I caused on last show regarding the ichthyosaurs. By trying to address multiple points in a similar vein, and writing the script at 3 in the morning, I misspoke and wound up completely butchering the report. Nevertheless, this correction provides a good opportunity to further emphasize the deficiencies in the evolutionary story. Now, if you'll recall, the ichthyosaurs were a dolphin-like marine animal. And last week I reported on an alleged evolutionary ancestor of the ichthyosaurs. Now, I am aware that the ichthyosaurs are considered reptiles and not mammals. Though I might point out that since we apparently do not have ichthyosaurs around today to study, we cannot observe whether they nurse their young or not. All we have to go on is fossils, and presumably mammal glands would not be preserved in a fossil state. 
I then thoroughly confused this issue by trying to address criticisms I would received from viewers about a similar line of the evolutionary story. The story of land animals moving back into the sea to evolve into whales. Now, the ichthyosaurs are not considered the evolutionary ancestors of the cetaceans, such as the whales and dolphins. My bad, sorry. This brings up a significant point, though. Pay close attention to what Ryosuke Motanai said regarding the alleged ancestor of the ichthyosaurs that I was reporting on. Katarhynchus represents a stage of the land-to-sea transition that was somehow lacking in the fossil record of the ichthyosaur lineage, while known in most other marine reptile and mammal lineages. Lineages, plural. Not only does the evolution myth propose that an unknown land ant creatures evolved by unknown, unobserved processes into marine reptiles like the ichthyosaurs, it also claimed that other lines of land animals also evolved into other marine reptiles, such as the plesiosaurs. Though nobody knows what creature evolved into the plesiosaurs. The process by which this happened is unknown and unobserved. Still, other land animals evolved into the cetaceans by unknown, unobserved processes, etc. By claiming multiple lines of this unobserved evolution, Operating by unknown processes, the impossibility of the story is multiplied exponentially. In the last episode, I briefly mentioned the problems with the evolution of planets. The conventional theory states that a ring of dust formed around a star, and that dust particles stuck to each other, becoming clumps of dust, which had more gravitational attraction to attract more dust, Eventually, it all became small rocks. Small rocks gravitationally attracted more rocks until it became asteroids, which attracted to each other, becoming a planet. Now, one specific problem I mentioned in passing was that experiments conducted had shown that, yes, dust can collect into small clumps and possibly even up to the size of small rocks. However, beyond that, the rocks had too much energy moving around and when they collided, they would instead break up into smaller rocks instead of joining into bigger ones, and then ultimately an asteroid. When I discussed this previously on the show, and again this time around, several people wrote in asking for references and citing papers they claimed contradicted what I said. Now, ironically, the papers that were provided said exactly what I said. Experiments in space serendipitously showed that dust would collect into dust clumps. Nothing was said about rocks. The only papers that discussed the growth of larger rocks were strictly computer simulations, and let's face it, while computer simulations have their place, they are nothing more than a simulation, doing exactly what we tell them to. As for references showing that large rocks cannot form, there are actually too many references, but here is a couple. Ashfog, writing in the annual review of planetary science, spelled it out quite nicely. Dust grains coagulate via Brownian motion and chemical or electrical sticking mechanisms. This can lead to sand to boulder sized agglomerates. However, too great a turbulence disrupts agglomerates faster than they form. Benz and Leinhardt et al. studied collisions involving meter to kilometer scale aggregates at 1 to 10 meters per second random velocities and determined their disruption to be a bottleneck for further growth. He then goes on to point out another problem in that once the rocks become big enough, they experience drag from the dust in the ring, which slows down the rock. This loss of speed then causes the rock to lose its orbit around the star, and it plummets to a fiery death in the star. No larger rocks being formed there. The whole point of the Icarus article by Morbidelli et al., was that anything between a few centimeters across and 100 kilometers across would systematically break down into smaller sub-meter rocks. So they concluded that the rocks somehow must have magically clumped together by some unknown unobserved process to jump from a few centimeters across to 100 kilometers across. Other articles you simply have to read to get the meat 
out of the article where they admit or even argue that you cannot get from submeter rocks to asteroids. Plain and simple. All of these points are fatal to the formation of planets by natural processes. Now, some might argue that I'm simply responding with, God did it. Well, maybe so. But if God did do it, then your arguing is the equivalent of trying to argue how a car came about without a creator. You can imagine it all you want. Then imagination has nothing to do with fact. Thanks for writing in, everyone. Steve wrote in on Facebook from Minnesota. Hi, eh? To my Canadian brother Ian Juby, eh? I've been watching your Genesis Week show for about two and a half years and really enjoy it. I was saved because of anti-creationist college teachers making ridiculous claims that I had to refute. In order to do that, I had to research the subjects in question. The more I learned, the more infuriated I became because of the lies I had been taught all through school. Thank you for your ministry. You are storing up treasures in heaven. Thanks for sharing your story, Steve, and thanks for the kind words. Nathan emailed a profound thought about thoughts. Hi Ian, I'm a big fan of the show and especially the Crevo Rants. They have been a huge blessing to me, my family, with my younger siblings and friends since they are a quick and entertaining way of sharing God's truth and the evidence of it. Anyway, I have some thoughts about, well, thoughts. Chemicals always react the exact same way given the exact same set of conditions, correct? So how can the atheist call any of their thoughts choices if they are all inevitable and result of billions of years of chemical processes? For every thought they have, they don't actually have any choice in the matter, pun intended. Therefore, how can they claim to have things like freedom or free thought when choices are essential for freedom? With that said, I contend that freedom is completely inconsistent with the atheistic worldview, and if there is no freedom, by both the claim of the Word of God, Romans 8.21, and their own worldview, they are slaves. Keep up the great work, Nathan. C.S. Lewis, a former atheist converted to Christianity, once wrote it profoundly. If the solar system was brought about by an accidental collision, then the appearance of organic life on this planet was also an accident, and the whole evolution of man was an accident too. If so, then all our present thoughts are mere accidents, the accidental byproduct of the movement of atoms. And this holds for the thoughts of the materialists and astronomers as well as for anyone else's. But if their thoughts, i.e. of materialism and astronomy, are merely accidental byproducts, why should we believe them to be true? I see no reason for believing that one accident should be able to give me a correct account of all the other accidents. It's like expecting that the accidental shape taken by the splash when you upset a milk jug should give you a correct account of how the jug was made and why it was upset. Nathan has taken this one step farther, and he's right. Chemistry is predictable, repeatable, observable. If your thoughts are merely electrical and chemical reactions, determined by nature, then this is another atheistic self-contradiction. These atheists are not free thinkers, as there is no freedom in their thoughts. And interestingly, they cannot criticize religious peoples for their thoughts about a creator god either. This is interesting, though, in that we now encounter an analogy to the computer. The computer processes thoughts, which are directed by chemistry applied to semiconductors, which direct and divert electrical impulses. The computer cannot think on its own, but quick question, did that computer have a designer? Absolutely. And the computer's thoughts are not just the result of chemistry and electricity, but are the results of the designer and the programmer. Our best minds on planet Earth have been working and wishing for decades for artificial intelligence, a computer that can think and learn on its own. Right now, our attempts at artificial intelligence are pathetic compared to the human mind. Our artificial intelligence is very artificial and not very intelligent. But if they did manage to build such a computer, it would speak volumes of the incredible ingenuity and intelligence of its creator. Even if that computer then came to the illogical conclusion that it had no creator. 
With true artificial intelligence and free will, the computer could choose to deny that it had a creator. That's not logical, but it is certainly within the realm of capability of such a computer. And thus, we see what is happening in the minds of the atheist. There is a reason they deny a creator God, and it certainly isn't because of logic or rational free thought. It is the result of ulterior motives, a desire to deny their creator. If an intelligently designed artificial intelligence computer denied the existence of its creator, the creators would be wondering why. If the computer is correctly and logically thinking in every other realm, then why oh why would the computer make such an illogical conclusion? Well, simple. Because free will can override logic. Now, there's much more to this, which I will get into hopefully soon in a show dedicated to answering atheist attractions. Sadly, many people who claim to be atheists are not atheists, but agnostics or actually believers in God. But they have been hurt or angered by other people, or they have been hurt by, they believe they've been hurt by God himself. Thus, their denial of his existence or hatred towards him are a reaction to what's happened in their lives. Now, I was there once. I was very, very angry at God, and I walked away from him. Told Jesus, take a hike. I'm totally sympathetic to those of you who are in that boat. But may I please encourage you to re-evaluate. I learned the hard way that for all intents and purposes, God had been slandered in my eyes. I didn't know the lies that had been told to me about God, and I believed the lies. I've since found out that he truly is a loving, caring, giving creator. He loved us so much that while we were enemies of his, he showed his love for us in that he gave us his son, Jesus Christ. Now, we may not understand what has happened or why, but events that happen to us are not necessarily a reflection of God's character, as I found out the hard way. That creator loves you so much that he died in your place, that you may live eternally. There is no greater love than this. All right, I have to call this a wrap. I'm your host, Ian Jimmy, saying thank you for watching, and I hope you'll join me again next Genesis Week. Remember, you can send in your questions, comments, hate mail, and tickets to the Toronto Maple Leafs game to us in a number of ways. Remember those words of warning from our Creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. We'll see you on the flip side. We are a viewer-supported program and need your support to keep this program on the air. Please pray for us, and if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K 2P4. While we cannot offer tax-deductible receipts outside of Canada, donors wishing to financially support the program can do so online at ianjubi.org slash donations. And thank you for your support.